This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today, we are talking with Alex Pollock about his new book, Finance and Philosophy, Why We're Always Surprised. Alex Pollock is a distinguished senior fellow at the R Street Institute. Before that, he was for a number of years a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's been the president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. And as I learned in this book, in addition to being a, a regular and wise commentator on financial policy, bank policy, regulatory policy, financial crises, he was a senior vice president of the Continental Illinois Bank uh, when it was bailed out in the early 1980s, which uh, I, I learned prior to the 2008 bailouts was one of the biggest bailouts in American history. So he has much to teach us about finance and philosophy. Alex Pollock, welcome welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Richard. And it's, it's great to be here. And I will tell you that living through as a, as a young senior vice president, the failure of continental Illinois was an extraordinarily educational experience. Well, maybe tell us about that here before we uh, get into these themes of, of finance and philosophy, because one of the things you talk about is we always repeat the past in finance. We never really get out from underneath it and learn. And yet here's, here's Continental Illinois, a massive bailout, and what's learned from it? What caused it, maybe, too? It's interesting. I, it, there's one uh, point uh, in the book where I, did, I discussed Continental in particular and put it in parallel with the failure of Bear Stearns a generation later uh, and discussed the similarities uh, between the two cases, which are, of which there are many. Um, and it was they were both caught up in asset price bubbles. Uh, in in subprime mortgages and and uh, housing in the case of, in real estate generally in the case of Bear Stearn and in the great oil price uh, bubble of the late 1970s and early 1980s uh, in the case of Continental Illinois and of course as often happens um, uh, when the when the short term lenders stop lending to you to finance your your long term investments, which have proven to be much riskier than you thought, uh, the game is up, and that was uh, true in both those cases. So for me, okay, the the living through uh, the Continental Illinois story, I joined the International Banking Department of Continental in uh, in 1969. And, uh, and Continental Illinois was one of the uh, most prestigious, best thought of, we all assume, solid and eternal big banks. So going through the crisis was a, was a great lesson, and it really triggered uh, my interest in financial history and whether we could discern these patterns and, and factors uh, that lead to such collapses. Uh, among the things I learned in 1984 was that Continental had failed and been bailed out by the government in 1934. Okay. So there was a cycle right there. <laughs> yeah. So thinking about uh, finance and philosophy, maybe talk about that, because I think when we think of the finance guys now, we think of uh, Wharton School MBAs, we think of Harvard MBAs, we think of quants, uh, we think of uh, you know, super smart men and women who go in, crunch numbers, and you know can read uh, the, the tedia or the tedium of, of financial documents, find problems, uh, write up disclosures, all of this sort of business. And yet you're introducing us into this conversation uh, about risk and uncertainty and belief in currency and things like this. Precisely, and especially uncertainty, which it's one of the principal points of the book to say is unavoidable, inescapable, and uh, and uh, and it doesn't matter how smart you are, because I think your description of very smart people, very uh, mathematically and legally and verbally talented, uh, going into finance is correct. Uh, but they don't do any better than all the previous uh, generations uh, of bankers and financiers, so many of them. Uh, many of whom couldn't do that math at all. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, think about um, the, 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 you know, just sure. add uh, one thought here. The, the fact that being extremely intelligent and having a lot of extremely intelligent people does not save you from getting into trouble is one of the major philosophical paradoxes uh, about finance. It isn't that people are stupid. It's that some of the biggest mistakes seen clearly in retrospect are made by some of the smartest people. Whereas one of my favorite lines, uh, which I used in the book, uh, uh, goes, the rocket scientists build a missile which landed on themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to figure out why that is. And this doesn't only apply to the private actors. It applies to all the government actors as well. You can have lots of smart central bankers and regulators with, with academic uh, credentials hanging all over them. Uh, and, they, and they are in the a mix of uncertainty along with everybody else. And they make giant mistakes like everybody else did, does, did, and does, and will. Yes. So uh, it's, it's contemplating that uh, paradox, yeah. uh, which seems to me deeply philosophical. It has to do with the nature of knowledge, the nature of human minds, the nature of financial reality as distinct from physical reality. And I, I say and I think that, that these are really, metaphysically speaking, two different kinds of reality. And if you think you're going to, as many people did, did and do think, uh, apply mathematics to the behavior of, of financial markets and, and credit and investing and leveraging and risk-taking, uh, if you think you're going to apply mathematics to that the same way that physics applies it to, say, the path of the planets, you're just wrong because they're two different kinds of reality. Now, I want to, I want to talk about that, but you also say, and I think this is frequently the other assumption, uh, which is not faith in the regulators, faith in the smart corporate finance guys, but the belief that these disasters come about solely through greed. Yes. As, you know, famously, yes, you know, that, yeah, uh, go ahead. That, that's a, a, a um, just a simple mistake. Uh, greed, of course, is with us. Greed is part of human nature, and it's always there. But why you know, greed is there in the in the good times? Greed is there in the stable times, and greed is there in the in the crisis. So greed is not the explanation. There's something much more interesting going on than that. You talk about uh, the intentions, <clears throat> the intentions of financial agents repeatedly interacting with one another in times of stability, producing or leading to. Uh, calamities and and these sorts of downfalls. And you talk about, in particular, you have a quote: uh, "Stability is actually the time when when the, when the greatest problems are actually developing, but they go unrecognized uh, by by all the relevant actors." And I and I wanted yeah. to I wanted to quote read this quote you've got on on page twenty one of your book and just get your comment. You, this is Professor George Kaufman, uh, banking <laughs> banking re regulator re regulator uh, academic. He says. Quote, everybody knows George Santayana's dictum that those who fail to study the past are condemned to repeat it. When it comes to finance, those who do study the past are condemned to recognize the patterns they see developing and then repeat them anyway. Now, that's very <laughs> souring, isn't it? <laughs> very witty sobering, also. I, yes. I, it was a, and sobering and witty at the same time. Yes, and, and so why is that? Why, uh, and, uh, one reason, of course, is that the, as opposed to those who study the past, like Professor Kaufman, who, who was a good friend of mine and, and who made that comment in a panel that I chaired, actually, on the, on the crisis. It was a great moment. Um, he's studying the past, but the vast majority of financial actors like me in 1984 have virtually no knowledge of financial history and these patterns. Uh, but even if you do, the, the nature of financial reality, uh, which creates the, the inescapable uncertainty, and I, and if I would like to talk in a minute about the difference between uncertainty and risk. No, that's what that's I wanted to get to of, next. Yeah. That's, 
that's fundamental arises from the fact that the the uh, the all of the actions um, uh, in financial markets by everybody by investors by bankers by borrowers by savers by regulators by central bankers uh, by the comments of uh, of pontificators like you and me richard uh, are are based on and must necessarily incorporate beliefs about what other people are doing which depend on what other people believe so there's this, uh, to me, philosophically fascinating interaction of beliefs about beliefs, and those beliefs, it, what I think about other people's beliefs change my belief, uh, and and so on, ad infinitum, and and that, I am convinced, uh, is one of the reasons why no matter how much you work on it. Uh, no matter no matter uh, how diligent or how smart you are, it is the the outcomes are always uncertain. The financial future is always not only not known but not knowable. Right. Uh, and hence the truth of, uh, of my my old friend George Kaufman's uh, statement there. So well, let, let's talk about the difference between risk and uncertainty, and you you build on the scholarship of Frank Knight. Uh, to do that. So maybe explore that for us and, and how that gets into finance and philosophy. Yes, this is a, a famous distinction. Frank Knight uh, wrote his, his great book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, in 1921, uh, and made this distinction very clear. Now, when we talk in ordinary language, it isn't risk or uncertainty is viewed as Maybe the same thing, or something highly related, but in this this technical sense of Frank and I, which I which I do think is is fundamental to to understanding um, the whole issue of why uh, uh, financial markets uh, behave the way they do, is that uh, in both cases, risk and uncertainty, the future is not known. But in the case of risk, in this technical meaning, the the odds of future outcomes are known, as with rolling uh, a fair die, for example, or or drawing from a from an unmarked pack of uh, of cards. Uh, you don't know exactly what will happen, but you do know uh, over time, in a large number of draws, that the outcomes will converge on. Um, on certain ratios or percentages, so you know the odds. The the thing to try to get into our minds is with uncertainty. Not only do you not know the outcome, but you don't even know the odds, and you cannot know the odds because the outcomes are dependent on this infinitely interactive, recursive, to use that word, mm -hmm. set of strategies, expectations, ideas, beliefs of, of all of a great variety uh, of actors, and all of these things are interacting with each other. Now, what happens in financial modeling is, uh, is that the uncertainty in very complex ways is treated as if it were risk. So the outcomes, I mean, and you can run a thousand scenarios and things, but they're all based on the idea that there are statistical statistical uh, odds of outcomes, and you are you are manipulating these odds. And when the models do that, there's no question that the math is right. I mean, the the, the model builders uh, designing, for example, uh, um, many tiered subprime securities or derivatives of those securities, it wasn't that their math was wrong. Their math was right. The question was whether the math matched the underlying reality. financial yeah. reality, and it and it didn't. It's almost as if when I read your part of the book, which I've, I've heard other people talk about the financial modeling that, that produced these securities, it's not, I mean, you say they, they sort of moved uncertainty into the category of risk. It's almost like they got rid of both, though, and just assumed they knew the deal. They assumed what was going to happen. 
and and could proceed without without any sense of uh, you know of a problem of failure. Um, I, th- I think that's true. Figuring that you you could control the uh, you you could create optimal strategies because you knew the odds. It's the same way that that bond rating or credit rating agencies operated or certain probabilities of outcomes. Of course, the, the actual outcomes had very different probabilities. Uh, one of the things I discuss in the book uh, is Eugene Derman's uh, argument that, well, financial models are not about predicting the future. They're about establishing a price today. Okay. It's all about what price would I buy or sell something? You know, at what price would this be a, a good thing to own or to be short, um, uh, and I think that's that's a, uh, a good point and a fair point. But uh, but I suggest that the prices today only make sense if you have some expectation of prices tomorrow. Yeah. All prices today uh, of assets, uh, of houses or equities or or, or debt. Uh, depend on your expectation of prices tomorrow, and prices tomorrow or prices week after next are just the thing that you don't and can't know. Okay. Yeah. So, is that... I, I want to tell Richard. Could I tell just sure. tell one little story sure. in here? Yeah. Uh, when I uh, when I when I talk to uh, groups of mortgage bankers, uh, I have this little routine that you, which uh, I love to do, which is if you make a, a a residential mortgage loan, what's the collateral for the loan? And they say, the house, of course. And I say, no, that's wrong. It's the price of the house. Your collateral, the only way you can get any money to pay off your loan is the price of the house, not the physical Mm. house. And question number two is, how much can a price change? The answer is a lot more than you think. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as I as I as I was listening to you um, talk about price, I mean, it's you know the the price clears uh, between a willing you know seller and a willing buyer, but or or you know a, a institution willing to lend and and, and someone who needs a loan. Uh, but yeah. what do you do with the price when you've got the United States federal government behind it uh, and putting its input uh, into the mix and and now you've got something, a whole new market, and how do you adjust for that? Or are you able to adjust for that? Because their their intervention is so large. Oh, absolutely. It changes the price. Yeah. And it changes the price in multiple ways. So, for example, if you have the United States government, as it insists on doing uh, very unwisely, uh, guaranteeing the bulk, uh, as you know, of the American residential mortgage market, about two-thirds or so, uh, that lowers the interest rate uh, investors will require to buy the debt because they're looking through to the either explicit or so-called implicit but nonetheless completely real guarantee uh, of the government. Uh, and so the, the interest rate is lowered, but lowering the interest rate ends up increasing the price of the houses that people are buying. Since you make it possible that for them, for the same payment, to have a bigger loan, the, re- the result is that you make the prices of the houses go up. We're experiencing this right now after eight years of extreme governmental manipulation to keep real interest rates negative or very low, yeah. um, uh, combined with the government guaranteeing two-thirds of the mortgage market, we have created another massive inflation in house prices. Um, so the house price gets to be much higher than it, than it would be in a, in a competitive uh, non-governmentally manipulated market. Well, is that good? So are you, you saying you you got a cheaper loan, but you you have to pay a lot more for the house? So are you saying and you set up? Yeah. No, no. Go ahead. I I just thought are you are you saying that yet again we failed to learn from a financial crisis? Absolutely. Well, we failed to learn from from oh. centuries of financial yeah. crises. Yeah. This last one is just one in a in a long. A row. I, I don't know if you enjoyed my, no, my I, chapter called "There's Usually a Banking Crisis Somewhere." 
Yeah, you know, but it's interesting Which, too what? to think about your financial <laughs> history. You know, your your financial history is, and then it's like you know, so you have this financial collapse, and there are all sorts of you know consequences for our country. I think there have been immense political consequences, social consequences, labor consequences. Uh, it, it ripples out, um, but it it does it it brings to mind. You quote James Grant several times in the book, and and he's been on this program to talk about financial crises and. You know, his, yeah. his contention is, and I, I think it, it would agree with yours, you know, these things happen uh, and they're recurring. The, the problem is don't make them worse. You want everything to clear out as rapidly as possible so we can get back to normal and, and start building again. And you know, his conclusion is a very classical liberal conclusion. Uh, government don't make it worse. Now, that may be politically unfeasible, but that's his position. Don't make it worse with all sorts of interventions. It seems to me almost fatalistically that's reading your book. That's that's sort of the best we could hope for. Yes, and and uh, it goes along with another theme of my book, which is I think most people imagine well, there's this financial system made up of private actors with a lot of government intervention, but then there are these um, wise figures who are above the fray the central bank, the regulators, the government, somehow looking down and knowing, or at least able to know what's going on and and manipulating it for the greater good. I I try to to show uh, what a mistaken idea that is. All of these government actors are in the fray, along with everybody else. They're in the the uncertain... um, um, infinitely complex set of interactions, and they're just one more actor um, um, who who can't know what the future will be and whose actions have uh, have consequences that they won't know. In, in the set of interactions includes everybody. Nobody is outside uh, the interacting system above looking down. Everybody, including you and me, are inside uh, the system of of interacting expectations, ideas, strategies, beliefs, confidence, fear, and whatnot. Yeah, uh, and and so you can't you can't um, uh, expect them to play the role as I discuss in the book of Platonic philosopher kings who who have superior knowledge to everyone else and who are going to straighten it out. That that's simply. Uh, contrary uh, to the nature uh, of human beings uh, and uh, to the nature of financial reality. Talk about, you have a chapter, uh, Faith and Skepticism. Uh, yeah. Faith, <laughs> faith, no, I think I might know where this is going. Faith and Skepticism in the realm of finance produces what outcomes? And and it's, it's, it's necessary, well, you say. Uh, yes, well, uh, um, I point out that that many people um, always say, "Well, we have to have confidence," which is another word for faith. Uh, but that the actual uh, financial virtue is not confidence; it's skepticism. And when everybody gets confident, that's what creates the crisis, the the, the excesses, the over leverage, the over the uh, over belief in models, the over belief in. Uh, uh, in well, this system is all nice and regulated. What could go wrong? Like say, savings and loans in the 1980s, which were extremely regulated, uh, and the 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 faith or the confidence creates the problem. And it would help if we were all much more skeptical about all of these things. But it wouldn't save us from problems, even if we were, because uh, but it might. It, it might moderate the problems if we had, uh, if we had uh, greater skepticism and uh, and less faith and confidence. Yeah, I mean, I, I, but it, it cycles back to this thought that stability creates instability. Faith that everything is going to be right tends to create things going going wrong. Uh, optimism uh, creates the pessimistic. Uh, outcomes. I, I don't know if you remember. There's a one of my favorite lines in financial history is is in the book from Jesse Jones, who was a tough old Texan, uh, 
uh, who ran the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in the 1930s and 40s, who, who said he was uh, observing the failed banks which had died of exposure to optimism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Well, now, as, as we think about, but in, in a way, I mean, there is, I mean, there's some sort of trust that makes a social order possible, that makes a... a that's that's correct. Orders. There's some sort of trust there. I suppose we're always playing on that coin when it comes to yes. finance, because as, as we talked about earlier, abstractions uh, that exist on paper enforced by law. Um, yes. In a way, it's inescapable. These are all, these are all social yeah. uh, creations of human activity, or what Hegel uh, would have called objective spirit. Yeah, that's that's what it is. That's why its its fundamental nature is completely different from the physical reality uh, that that uh, people would like to to model science on. Um, uh, one of I don't know if you if you uh, uh, enjoy it. I hope you did my my compendium of aphorisms uh, yeah. at, at the end. But you may remember one of them that says economics is history trying to be physics. Right. Well, well, it's the, it's this envy of the mathematical control uh, of of nature, which then gets to be applied to hoping to have mathematical control of economics and finance, which at least in my opinion, cannot uh, cannot ever succeed, and, and therefore the chapter of why economics is not a science is not and can never be a science, no matter how much you work at it. Well, and then there's also the thing, economics is always controlled by politics as well, or heavily informed. It's always, well, it's always intermixed with politics. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So you and I guess we all uh, have a sense of the uncertainty of political outcomes. Well, yeah, uh, and economics and politics are are mixed up, and the expectations that go into financial markets and the pricing of assets, uh, and to the extent of the uh, leverage uh, that's or, or of the debt that's built into a system, all reflects beliefs about politics as well. So I guess that, that brings to mind, I mean, the, you know, the role of the f uh, central banks um, in all of this. And you're know, thinking about the Federal Reserve, which you talk some about the book, and, and you've written a lot for Law and Liberty on the Federal Reserve. And, and I guess I was to ask you sort of this position that they're in of independence. It's, it's a weird constitutional position they're in that exists because of a, you know, the common sense notion we don't want their policies completely controlled by Congress. Uh, but at the same time, their independence produces other outcomes that we might not like, you and I might not like, like, you know, quantitative, quantitative easing policy, uh, among yes, others. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I suggest that, the, uh, that the, the notion that the Federal Reserve should be independent, of course, a, a notion particularly believed in by the Federal Reserve itself and its officers, yes. uh, is constitutionally completely unacceptable. No, no part of the government should be completely independent. Uh, all should be uh, enmeshed in a system of checks and balances, uh, and that should apply to the Federal Reserve as well. Uh, as I think about it, the the claim that in, that independence is desirable or even possible is based on a completely false claim. That the Federal Reserve has superior knowledge of economic and financial outcomes, which it can use uh, to fix prices and manipulate markets, and and nothing is more evident. And I cite a lot of examples of it in the book. Uh, nothing is more evident than the Federal Reserve does not have any such superior knowledge. It has no superior knowledge at all, in spite of its being. Uh, probably the largest employer of Ph.D. economists in the world, and having uh, all of the computers, all of the data, all of the meetings, all of the informal flow of information all over the world, it, its ability uh, to know uh, uh, what is going to happen, or including the results of its own action, is no better than anybody else's. And its actions are informed uh, 
my fundamentally political beliefs about what should happen yeah and and uh, and and political decisions are are in a in a democracy or a, a democratic republic uh, are the are the function of the legislature by definition Ta- so that there needs needs to be a legislative over uh, an effective legislative oversight uh, thinking about so let's, let's talk about one area quantitative easing we used to hear a lot of commentary about that after the 2008 financial crisis. How did all of that, or, or where is that? Uh, I mean, I, I would love to hear kind of where things stand now. Well, it's, it still exists. The, the, uh, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, as we know, uh, got up to historic highs. And by the way, uh, one of the most important things to know about central banks is central banks are enmeshed in an international fraternity of central banks with constant communication so between the let us say the uh, European Central Bank the Fed the Bank of Japan the Bank of England um, and they all uh, entered into similar programs especially uh, in Europe and in Japan and they all do this together now uh, one result of uncertainty is that you want to do what other people that you respect are doing, and if you're all doing it together, you all feel it's more likely that you're right. Uh, hence, the uh, line in, in the book, um, a prudent banker is one who goes broke when everyone else goes broke. Yeah. The same is true of the same is true of central banking. A, a careful central banker is one who's who's doing what the other central banks uh, are doing or believes the same things. Uh, and central bank beliefs over time uh, are very faddish, are very you know subject to fashion. So if you look at the at the history of monetary regimes, uh, they shift uh, over time uh, uh, dramatically. Let's say from the gold standard uh, of the uh, up to 1914 uh, to the gold exchange uh, standard to the Bretton Woods system. To the uh, mm-hmm. to yeah. the uh, managing a discretionary yes. management of interest rates to monetarism to now the current theme which is a commitment to perpetual inflation at the rate of two percent these things shift because they're they're fundamentally uh, they're fundamentally uncertain and so uh, we, we we have to understand that when you're operating in, in realms that are fundamentally uncertain, you need to be in, enmeshed in uh, uh, in checks and balances, and you should not be independent. Of course, there have been times when the Federal Reserve is just the complete servant of the Treasury, and this happens in all countries. And the central bank is part of the government. The government's desire is always above all to finance itself to issue the debt that it wishes to issue and and central banks are extremely useful in the buying up that debt as in quantitative easing I mean, the the biggest thing they bought was treasury treasury bonds so uh, there have been times when the Federal Reserve has been completely subservient to the treasury that's wartime the war is the priority the treasury needs to issue this this debt and the Federal Reserve assists it any by either buying it or promoting it or financing it uh and then in, yeah. in, in non-war times we get this uh this claim of independence yeah. then the quantitative easing you asked me where quantitative easing is the, the federal reserve's uh, uh portfolio of mortgages and long-term government bonds uh has just Dipped slightly below four trillion dollars, which is still gigantic. They are letting it run off hmm. as it matures, little by little. It's still huge, so it's still a huge portfolio. Uh, in the beginning of quantitative easing, the Fed considered at some point they would be selling maybe uh, some of this, but they they then uh, uh, realized that if they were selling it, they would likely be incurring very large realized losses, capital losses, because if interest rates are higher, the prices of the bonds will be lower. 
especially if the biggest investor is known to be in the market trying to unload them, yeah. which would be the Fed. So now they've given up any idea of selling it, and they're just slowly uh, letting it uh, letting it mature. But it's still there, and it's still very big. And the Federal Reserve is still the, the single biggest investor in mortgages in the form of mortgage-backed securities, which is uh, which is fairly uh, amazing from a from a historical point of view. But uh, if you believe my book, you should uh, you should believe that you will be amazed and surprised fairly regularly. What do you think? <laughs> What do you? I mean, when you look at this, uh, when you look at this quantitative easing policy, what do you think has been the the biggest effect on the economy? Is, is it mal or you know investment misdirected or directed into underperforming uses or? Uh, I think so. I, yeah. I think the combination of the portfolio of the quantitative easing of the bed, the Fed's buying the bonds, plus the Fed's paying interest on deposits. Uh, which is really important to understand the role of the Fed over the last uh, eight, nine years, which is that the banks were happy just to hold the deposits instead of, in classical banking theory, it, the banks would have this large non-earning asset, which they would try to get out of. Uh, and, and by doing that, they would wish to make loans and investments, which would set off a credit inflation. Uh, Chairman Bernanke incredibly cleverly got the Congress to authorize the payment of interest on reserves so the banks were happy to to yeah. earn a, a high risk-adjusted return on these deposits. And then that put the Federal Reserve in the case of being a principal credit allocator in the whole system. And where did, where did it allocate credit to? Two places, housing and, uh, and financing the government deficit. So that's where the credit went. The, the credit that went through the Fed went to housing, went to the government deficit, as opposed to other things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that sort of gets into. I think you you have a nice discussion. What does risk free debt mean? <laughs> and here we are with the sovereign allocating untold amounts of credit. We you know, and it, and it also brings to mind, I think, Bastiat's observation. You know, what is seen and unseen, and so there's whole realms of potential wealth that could have been created with that credit. But it was used by the government for its own purposes, so we don't know. Uh, that, what, what did, that's what, right. We you don't know. know. Yeah. But the risk-free right. risk nature, you just point out financial history, even in this country. And we, can get, we can get into the municipal aspect of this, which is, which is a big problem for us right now. just hasn't yet hit, uh, I think. Uh, but, yeah, talk about that. The, um, the thing I say is, well, people readily say, well, government, that, that's risk-free. Economists like to do that because it gives them a – a so-called risk-free interest rate, but I, I uh, try to show, uh, and I think it's I think the case is pretty clear that there's nothing risk-free uh, about sovereign debt. The, the sovereign defaults on their debt uh, are, are are very common historically in a lot of countries, and much I think to most people's uh, surprise, including uh, the United States, which had an explicit default uh, on its debt in, in 1933 when it refused to pay the gold coins that it had promised to pay on its bonds. And there's, a, I think, a pretty pretty interesting story that's told in the book about how well, the government decided that it, it wanted to uh, renege on what obviously was its promise. And no one, um, no one questioned the promise of the government, but it just decided it didn't didn't wish to. It was, as they said at the time, against public policy uh, to keep your promise, and in the end they didn't, uh, and were upheld in a very interesting Supreme Court decision, which was five to four. Yes, uh, in in the 1930s. Uh, again, we see. I, I tell the story of the uh, of the disappearance of silver coinage, which is more recently uh, in the 1960s. Um, uh, when there, when there were, uh, you, you, you will remember these alphabet silver certificates, uh, which signed by the secretary of the treasury and the treasurer of the United States said, this certifies there is on deposit in the treasury of the United States, one silver dollar payable to the bearer on demand. Uh, 
Uh, and in the 1960s, inflation, when the price of silver made the silver dollar worth more than a dollar, people had, there was a run on silver certificates, and the Treasury and the government finally simply decided we were not paying. Yeah. And um, um, so, <laughs> w- and that they put it in into a law. So if you find a silver certificate today. Uh, which I have a couple at home, they still say on them uh, the clear promise of the United States to give you a silver dollar, but you can't get the silver dollar because they won't do it. So what is what does a sovereign mean in terms of debt? Well, uh, it means that if you don't want to pay, you don't have to because you're the sovereign, either the king uh, or, or the government. Now, you can default by outright repudiation or or not paying, as has happened hundreds of times in history by governments, of course, most recently uh, by Greece, Venezuela, uh, uh, Argent- Argentina may have one. Yeah. We're here. You can think about other troubled cases now. The Russia uh, defaulted in the 1990s uh, on its sovereign debt. But the cleverer way to default, of course, is through inflation. So you don't have a, you always, you, you, you don't not pay the amount of nominal currency. You just, you just uh, reduce or, or destroy the value of the currency and then you, you pay it, uh, in inflated or, or depreciated currency, which you control. It's just another way to default, in fact, but it's a little more, uh, it puts more of a polite, Sheen on it, and I, I tell in the book the story, which I get from a really great book, which was written in 1933 called "Sovereign Debt and Autopsy," uh, written by a guy who was a was a, a credit rater for for I think Standard and Poor's, one of the credit rating agencies, who who recites the the vast history of of sovereign defaults historically and up to the 1930s. And he tells the story of uh, Dionysus, the tyrant of Syracuse, who uh, ran out of money and couldn't pay his debts. So he told the people uh, of his domain that under penalty of death, they had to turn in all their all their coins, which were silver coins. And according to the story, he took all the silver coins, which said one drachma on them, restamped them two drachmas, and paid off the debt. So, th- thereby, <laughs> thereby becoming the father of central banking. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's interesting. No, so, from 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 Dionysus uh, to, to to contemporary day Illinois. Um, now, they obviously, Illinois. They, obviously, they are limited. They they cannot inflate their uh, situation away, but they're they're in bad shape. Uh, so right. A number of municipalities. And note, neither and, could Greece, and neither could Puerto Rico. Right. Two massive defaults of recent times. Uh, yeah. Because they they didn't control they didn't have the uh, they didn't have the control of the currency to depreciate it either in in foreign exchange terms or or uh, in inflationary terms. Yes. Yeah. So now you got Illinois. And you, yeah. So now so now we're with <laughs> Illinois. Um, why in in your judgment are you know debts you know, you know Pollock's law debts that cannot be repaid will not be repaid. Uh, Illinois seems to be in that situation. There are a number of states I think could be in that situation. Yeah. Uh, many people, I, 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 I think, thought that we would be in this phase much sooner, uh, but yet their repudiation of their debts has, has not occurred yet. Do you see that as a as a well thing coming? Historically, uh, there there were multiple uh, defaults and some repudiations of debt by states of the United States in the 19th century. That that has indeed happened. Uh, historically, there's a list of all the states which defaulted on their debt uh, in the book, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. But this, uh, the current state debt is a particular kind of debt and a particularly dangerous kind of debt, that is to say, pensions. Yes. Because in, in running pension plans, you're, you're able to make big promises that are, see, are, are far off in the future. Uh, and it seems like the day will never come, and maybe for you, the politician at the time, in fact, it won't come. It'll come to your to your successors, but the day does ultimately arrive. Uh, I, I quote in the book a famous line from David Hume, uh, who is, of course, both a great philosopher and a great economist. Uh, 
to the effect that it would be no more imprudent to give a prodigal son a credit in every banker's shop in London than to enable a statesman to draw bills on posterity. Uh, because we all love this idea of putting off the obligations into the future. And I say we could actually write this for modern terms. It, will, it would be no more imprudent than to give a prodigal son a credit in every bank in London than to allow a politician to set up pension plans. Yes. Because <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah, and, 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 and the dynamics of that have been you know, well noted, that there's no one really to oppose them except for voters who – you know, don't really see or understand this until it's too late. Um, so the thinking about now, I mean, if think about your, uh, a lot of the things you talk about, concepts, as you look at our current scene, what keeps you up at night? Well, let me tell you uh, what doesn't keep me up okay. at night, and okay. that is, that <laughs> is the, the long-term outlook. So I uh, I think skepticism is good, and there are many things you could be pessimistic about in the short run. But in the long run, uh, as long as we've still got uh, what some people call a capitalist, but I prefer to call an enterprising economy, which is an economy full of enterprise and, uh, and entrepreneurship combined with the rule of law, the long-run trend is going to be uh, to continue uh, the amazing uh, uh, production of well-being for ordinary people like you and me, Richard, yeah. uh, by, by this economy. And uh, I see uh, 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 there's a chapter in there called The uh, the Wonderful Trend and the Troublesome Cycle. But the trend is clear uh, over 200 years, and I see no reason to think it, it won't continue that uh, the, the, the well-being creating, and that's not only physical well-being, but also uh, intellectual and, and, uh, and cultural richness uh, created uh, by the enterprising economy, uh, is just going to continue. And if you can grow uh, at 1% or 2% a year, over long periods of time through the amazing power of, of compound interest, the effects on the lives of ordinary people are astonishing. If, if you look back to where life was 100 yes. or 200 years ago, you can, you can easily see this. So I'm very optimistic on the trend. Okay. Along the trend, as this trend continues, we're going to have cycles. And the, cycle, uh, the cycles... I suggest in the book you have to ask yourself, is the trend possible without the cycles? Or, the, or, or are the cycles, the, the vicissitudes, uh, to use Schumpeter's term, are they an inherent part of the wonderful trend? That's what this chapter is about. And you can't know the answer to this, but I think the answer is you can't have the trend without the cycles. Because the trend is created by the creation of uncertainty through entrepreneurial risk-taking, overly optimistic uh, activity. And the uncertainty which creates the trend, I think, also necessarily creates cycles. So my, my vision in, of, uh, of, of the financial, both history and future, is that the upward-sloping trend continues doing amazing things uh, for completely ordinary people. But while the trend is going upwards, we're going to keep cycling around it through uh, financial uh, and, uh, and economic adventures of uh, overexpansion, bubbles, crises, crashes, shrivels. This is my own word I'd like to use. But what happens after the bubble inflates? It shrivels. Yeah. Uh, and and we can just look forward to that, and it will each to each episode we go through, I think will surprise us. But we shouldn't be surprised about the overall pattern. Alex Pollock, thank you so much. We've been talking uh, with Alex Pollock, author of Finance and Philosophy. Appreciate it. This is your host Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at LibertyLawSite.org, where you can subscribe comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation.
Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. 